Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jeremy Barrio about agile transformation and finding the right path for each team, department, and organization. Jeremy Barrio, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am super excited to have this conversation with you today. It was fun, uh, you know, as we're just chatting in the pre-interview, uh, we, we've been preparing for this for a while and reading over your background and kind of the areas of focus, I thought today we could really focus our conversation around two things that you do a lot of work with, and that is agile transformation and doing that in a way where you're finding the right path for each team, department, and organization. And I think we both, it's kind of our pet peeve, you know, when when consultants go into organizations with off-the-shelf, cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all approaches, or some magical model that somehow is going to uh, change the world and, and magically fix the organization, you know, those kind of simple solutions just don't work. And so we're going to dive into that. We're going to explore that a little bit more and talk about how we can be more flexible and and approach agile transformation while looking for the unique, the specific approach that will work for whatever team you happen to be working with. As we get started, I wanted to share Jeremy's bio with everybody. Jeremy helps organizations achieve higher business value without cookie cutter methods to have the right game plan specific for them. He believes that value is not as hard to find as most think. It's a matter of finding the right path for each team, department, and organization. As an agilist, he treats every client And once the right path is found, the journey becomes easier. Whether it's an agile transformation, creating an enterprise quality assurance strategy, coaching, training, or whatever, he believes in ensuring everyone succeeds and the organization is set up for continuous growth. Uh, Everything in your bio, I completely agree with. That's certainly the mentality I also have. So I think we're probably two peas in the pod in that regard. And I think we'll have a nice conversation. But before we dive into the dialogue, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context? So yeah, for me, I think uh, it was interesting. I've I've come, I came from a a corporate background for years for a couple of decades. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that uh, I decided to go out on my own. Uh, There was a situation that came up and it was a perfect opportunity uh, and the challenges that I came across which is fun was starting a new firm going out on your own and about three months later a pandemic global pandemic happens um, the good thing was and is is because of how I treat agile and treat different situations I was able to adapt a lot faster and sooner I was able to show other organizations how they could adapt as well yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, what a perfect, I mean, a difficult and challenging context, but what a perfect context um, to be able to demonstrate agile and to be able to demonstrate, um, you know, specific approaches unique to organizations or teams that will fit for them. Uh, you know, I, I think everyone got disrupted by the pandemic. I, there, there were certainly some organizations that were a little bit more prepared for it than others. Uh, some some that were ready to flip that switch to virtual work, you know, faster than others. But everyone was disrupted, and everyone had to pivot, and and it was really challenging for pretty much everybody. And so, but but what that looks like, that pivot and that transition, uh, and how the leadership is going to respond to those changes, how that looked for organization A is probably not going to be the same for organization B, C, D, E, right? And yeah. and in each case, there's some common principles, sure. But there's also just unique culture, unique context, unique 
people dynamics, like all of that is unique. And so you have to be able to tailor an approach in an appropriate way. Otherwise you're going to, if you're just trying to copy what you see, you know, like Facebook or Google doing, and you think, yeah. oh, they have, they have the answer. So let's just do what they did. You know, that's a recipe for failure because you're not them. They're, they're something different. Uh, even if there's similarities between your businesses. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of the key thing. Like there's no, no two team, no two organizations, departments, you name it. No one is the same. Like everyone has their own individual, uh, behaviors and actions and it's the underlying behaviors within an agile group an agile team that's what really kind of gets the ball rolling and gets things moving and being that effective self-managed team and working and when everyone did the main pivot uh 18 months ago i think it was uh, roughly 18 months ago when everyone kind of yeah okay we're gonna shift off we're gonna do everything virtual we're gonna do this yep we're agile we're gonna make that switch i think it opened up uh, almost like a Pandora's box for a lot of organizations because yes, most organizations were allowing people to work from home, but it was on a sporadic basis. They were not able to adapt fast enough to deal, okay, the entire office is now virtual and using the tool. And I think from a leadership perspective where some of those failures happen was even though in their mind they they saw themselves as agile. They still had that command and control of people in the office. They could still kind of have that voice and do kind of saying, okay, you guys have to do this and not having that self-managed team run around. I think that's where those organizations like B, C, and D, where they ran into problems in that it was, they were able to pivot, but instead of turning on a dime, they were like turning uh, like a huge roundabout to get to where they needed to get yeah, it was their aircraft carrier trying to turn, right, <laughs> as opposed to the dinghy. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's a great way to, to frame it. And the command control element, like you said, I, I think, you know, that, that's, that's an old model of leadership. That's an old model of management that's perhaps served its, its purpose more during an industrial age. But we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the, the fourth phase of the industrial revolution and we're in a service economy and and we just command control doesn't work uh, and in in the office space you could kind of when everyone's together you can kind of give the air of empowerment and mutual accountability and like everyone can kind of drive their own meaning and purpose and, and guide their own work you can kind of say those things but then you're also still there and you can walk around and you can see what people are doing and you can still kind of control things. But once it goes virtual, you know, you really lose that control. And that really made a lot of organizations uncomfortable. Uh, I'm at a university. Uh, I'm a professor as well as my consulting work. And, and uh, I, I saw my university grapple with that too, uh, tremendously. And that's in, a, in a, an arena where there's a lot of autonomy and flexibility already with professors. Yeah. But man, they, they really struggled with allowing people to work remotely and what that would look like and putting in place all of these checklists and all of these uh, procedures. And it, it just became a, a bureaucratic nightmare to try to pivot into this remote kind of an environment. And that's even in an organization that was probably a little bit better set up for it than some. Uh, and so... Yeah, I think that's just a real challenge. And it's, it has been a wake up call. Organizational leaders have had to really wrestle with kind of some underlying assumptions of the organization and the culture that they've just taken for granted and always kind of, you know, taken as, as organizational fact, like this is the way it needs to be done. And now we're realizing, no, it doesn't actually need to be that way. Um, and hence agile, uh, the organizations that have really thrived over the last 18 months have, have been those that have been able to pivot more quickly, that have been more adaptive, have been able to iterate, um, more, uh, regularly and ultimately they've, they've had more success. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting when anyone brings up a conversation of agile, they think, uh, strictly software development and you've had the manifesto since 2001, where it says the agile software development manifesto so everyone kind of leans towards that and when the pan like in early 2020 when the pandemic happened what i found really interesting was uh a lot of the stores they would they would say okay we can't have anyone in the store okay we'll start doing curbside and they start kind of changing how their model worked and 
a lot of those organizations, the, 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 the stores, those mom and pop stores, they, they started to succeed. They started to kind of get their way through where uh, I remember reading an article a little while ago, uh, there was a, a pizza restaurant just in uh, south of Toronto where they had to close down. And they part of it was they just couldn't wrap their head around on how to change their model a little bit, which I thought was kind of odd because it's pizza. Everyone gets pizza delivered. So it was really interesting to see how those other organizations that no one would even thought of being agile, they're technically doing it and they're being that agile. They're, they're changing their behaviors. It's just a little bit different. Like it's a different view. And that's what I like doing. Like I've worked with clients where um, they wanted their sales team to be agile. They wanted their uh, marketing team to change things up to instead of being that hierarchical, okay, we're going to wait for this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that that type of sales model we're able to work with them and now they don't have that basic marketing models like, okay we're going to do this okay now we're going to okay now once that's done we're going to do this okay once that's done we're going to do this and then hopefully whatever marketing plan we have it's going to work and we're going to get some new clients we're getting some new leads they're able to now iterate to the point with like very short iteration saying okay does the market still accept this? Okay, yep, okay, good, now we can keep going. Does the market still look like it's gonna be ed tech? Okay, yep, good, okay, let's keep moving in that fashion. And then they, if they do have to switch, instead of going from ed tech to uh, logistics, let's say, most of the work they've done up until that point created their base, created their architecture where it's not that much of a shift. It's just a small change here and there. It's like, okay, all the plans we've done up to this point was for ed tech, Okay, let's just change ed tech to logistics and make the quick adjustments and then go with that path. Yeah, I, th I th excellent. Thank you for that description. And you're right. Oftentimes when we're talking about agile transformation, we're not talking about wholesale major shifts. We're talking about small iterative adjustments, right? Um, and, and so if we're doing it right, uh, then we're, we're kind of in a constant learning mode. We're in a constant growth mode, um, you know, growth mindset. And, and we're just trying to iterate rapidly and, okay. and finding what fits better. Um, as, as you were chatting just then and, and sharing that perspective, it, it came to my mind that perhaps we should step back for a moment and define agile more specifically. I, I think everyone listening knows what, you know, that we've heard the term over and over and over again. I think everyone's familiar with it generally, um, but I also hear it getting misapplied often, um, the, the term and the approach. So let's step back for a moment. And what, how would you define agile? Like you said, in software development, that's kind of, um, you know, the origins of it, but it's certainly applicable in many other kind of arena. So let's set the groundwork there. And then we can talk about how we might do that in ways that are unique to each organization. Sure. So one of the biggest misconceptions that I've come across, and I think a lot of others have, is that they feel like Scrum, Scrum's the framework or safe, and you, you, you implement that framework, you're now agile, and that's the way you're going to go. And really, uh, there was a book I read a few months ago, uh, the title is escaping me right now, uh, and it brought up a point and it, to me, it, it dawned on me, like I, it was the way I believed it. And I saw it and it was saying like, agile is more a philosophy. It's because everyone wants to like, okay, we want to be mat a mature agile group. Well, really, yeah. If you look at maturity, you look at CMMI, you look at all those other organizations that have those maturity models, it's taken the process and get a little bit better and get a little better and get a little bit better. But if you look at agile, like the agile journey itself, there's no end. Like there is, like you're just going to keep going and becoming more and more agile as you go. And if you look at it as a, from a philosophy standpoint, it's you're given your guidelines and now the teams can work together and move across. One organization I worked with, they thought, again, because they, were, they had scrum teams, they were considered agile and they tried to get everyone else to become scrum teams. And we, you, you brought this up a little bit earlier, like it will bring in like different frameworks. And I see frameworks as more as tools. Like they, and if you have the right tool with the right team, it's going to work awesome, especially with the right, they have the right behaviors and they have the right actions and get things going, know how to use it. 
But if you try to put like say a scrum team in a finance team, a finance department, it's gonna be a tough go because if you go through scrum and you do the ceremonies and the, or the events is what most people call them now, I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. In a finance team, it doesn't really work all that well, but if you put them on say a Kanban type fashion, they'll be able to run through it really quick because it's just taking your work and you go over a certain period of time and away you go. So for me, agile is, is a philosophy. It's like there's your behaviors inside where you have your guidelines and you go and you, you become better at what you do. Like um, personally in my life my, and my family, like we're, I, I bring in some of those agile behaviors to some of the stuff we do here in the house. Um, like my kids, they have their own little Kanban board of stuff they got to do throughout the week. And we plan that out. So it's, it's the mindset and behaviors and the philosophy of your guidelines. That's how I see as agile. And like a lot of organizations and teams that I've worked with, when we start working on that type of fashion, they, the success and the improvement and the value they provide, it, it hockey sticks up. It, it just, yeah. they, they, they can't believe the value they see uh, just with even small coaching sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. And you've already, I mean, you started to describe how that then fits with your overall mentality of the right path for each team department and organization. Let's speak to that a little bit more specifically. Like, why is that so vital? Um, I mean, there are so many firms out there that have more or less off the shelf kind of solutions with trademarked, you know, phrases and, and copyrighted models. You know, these are the solutions that will help transform your organization, you know, in the consulting world, that's super common. Um, So why can that be a problem? And in what way can we utilize models um, and frameworks in an effective way without allowing them to be overly prescriptive uh, and rigid in how a particular organization, a particular team might try to implement them. Yeah. So, and I brought this up a little earlier, like earlier about like tools, tools in the toolbox. So yes, you have all these different frameworks and methods and copyrighted phrases, all that, all that jazz. If they just kind of go in and say, this is what you're going to kind of a big box with a bow on it saying, here you go. It's, yeah, they're taking their expertise saying, yes, this worked because I had this work with company A, but your company B, you're not, there might be things within the culture that are just not going to work. You're basically taking a hammer to put in a screw, right? You're, it's just a different maybe tool set or you're trying to implement, like you're saying, okay, everyone, I want you to build a house, but all you get is a hammer and nails. That's it. And yeah, you'll build a house. Is it going to be a valuable house? Probably not uh, because like you need saws, you need like drywall, you need all the fun stuff to build. But if you just have one tool to do everything, it's just not going to work. Or you're eventually it will, it will 
have some sort of value. Yes, you'll have a roof over your head. It won't be probably the best roof then, but it's gonna take way much longer to get to where you need to get. Um, like I've worked on uh, waterfall programs and stuff where there's, oh, it's gonna take us eight months. Well, two years later, uh, and it wasn't, well, it was implemented, it was put out into production, but it was never used. It was just commented out because the executives at the time said, oh, this is taking way too long. It's not gonna, there's no value anymore. And they rush off. But if they were, if they did everything kind of agile-ish and use those rate behaviors and iterate all the way through, they would have probably finished that in less than eight months and probably would have like got ahead in the market. But it's just unfortunate that that happens. Yeah. So not trying to put a square peg into a round hole, trying yeah. to, you know, use a, a hammer when you need a screwdriver, you know, whatever the metaphor you want to use. I think that's absolutely right. That absolutely we need to focus on the fit within the context that we're working and context really matters. It's a, it's a big yes. deal. So, I mean, you can, you can get two, two companies, say two teams at two different companies, but they're in the same industry, same general business model, you know, same kind of general customer base. So for more or less, they're very similar organizations, at least on the surface, right? Yes. And you have these two teams, you try to do the exact same thing in this one team and then do it over here chances are it's not going to work. It just won't because you all the surrounding contextual factors uh, have variations. And so again, commonalities, yes. Frameworks, yes. Uh, principles that can be applied in different situations, yes. But you have to go into all of those situations uh, with your eyes wide open. Uh, and you have to be willing to, to do the, the research necessary to understand the teams that you're working with if you're trying to bring about you know, some sort of transformational change. Yeah. Um, and, and there's no shortcut for that. So when I see, and I get it, I understand why when, when you see firms promoting off the shelf, um, you know, prepackaged solutions, you know, there's economies of scale for them. It's easier, quicker, it's already established, right? Now they can just kind of go pitch the project, uh, the, the product. Uh, for organizations, it's faster. Uh, so they don't have to put in as much time up front you know, with a consultant to try to understand the context, they can just kind of bring someone in, do the training, do whatever the transformation is, and then be done. And it's just kind of a faster process. But, you know, garbage inputs in garbage yeah. outputs, right? And so, you know, it may be cheaper, quote unquote, in the short term, but in the long term, are you actually having sustainable change the way you want it? Um, are you actually accomplishing what you would hope to accomplish? And I think the answer is usually no. And it's, it's one of the re main reasons in my mind that change initiatives so often fail within organizations. The stat that always gets thrown around, I'm not sure what the real basis for this number is, but that, you know, people say 80 plus percent of all change initiatives fail in organizations. Why? Uh, multifaceted reasons uh, for that, but a big one is people not taking the time to truly understand the context within they're trying to, you know, bring about this transformation. Yeah. Like, it, this, uh, there's a report that comes out every year, the state of agile. Um, and the tw in 2020, I don't think the 2021 has come out yet, but in 2020, they looked at like 2000, I think it was 2000 organizations. And they found uh, the ones that they have is they found like 5% would be considered agile, like from nuts to bolts, where the remaining 95% are like, some of them are slowly getting there. Uh, and then the rest kind of struggle. And then there's a small amount that just don't even do it. And where I think a lot of things happen is they get into, uh, there's a term I heard a while ago, it's called hyper scrum mentalism, where it is, oh, we're doing scrum. So thou shalt do this, this, this become very, very rigid with all their events and how everything goes and say, as long as you do it, we're considered agile and not really get the value out of it. Like, where I try to go into organizations, I treat it as um, creating like an operating system within their agile frameworks. So if you, a good analogy is think of your phone. Your phone has apps up the wazoo, like mine has a bunch. If I look at my kids' tablets, I know they have apps all over the place, but each team could be their own agile team. It would be considered an app and each one work 
each app will work just fine as long as you have the right operating system underneath it for it to work through and to function. So when I go into organizations, I go in looking at their operating system. So I, I take a deeper dive. Like they, if they want to use Scrum, cool. Let's look at it and see, okay, is this the right tool for you guys to do and make certain suggestions? Um, there is even an article I read last week where it came up was like, what if a team doesn't want to do Scrum anymore? They just decide, nope, Scrum's not for us. It can happen. And it's actually in the end, you sort of do want that to happen because you want them to evolve to a point where maybe some of the events or some of how things are going, maybe they can just kind of keep chugging along and just kind of work their way through it. And that's how I see, instead of maturity, I see evolution. I don't see it as, oh, you're now at this step. You're now at this step. You're now at this step. It's now, and that bases on the philosophy as well. Like it's all about evolution. So you evolve your teams, you evolve your organization, and there's no end point to an agile journey. It's just, you're just gonna keep going. And that's how you gotta see it. Yeah, I love that. I, I think it's so important for us to not get dogmatic. Uh, I like the way you termed it, you know, this fundamentalism. Uh, and that it's funny because normally we think about fundamentalism or rigidity, you know, dogma in relation to religious perspectives, political perspectives, right? But there are, there's economic dogma, there's uh, agile dogma. <laughs> like, I think any, any, really, anytime you have some sort of, some sort of kind of uh, guiding philosophy, there's potential for people to get really rigid and dogmatic with it and, and fundamentalists. And then that starts to really defeat the purpose of the framework, right? Which yeah. usually those frameworks exist uh, and were created to provide flexibility in implementation and, and guidance, not prescription, right? And yeah. so I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to be very careful with it. I think agile is wonderful. Agile transformation is a great philosophy. It's a great overall approach. I completely agree with you that we need to be so careful and not trying to um, get caught up in this kind of one size fits all, or it worked for our team. So it must work for your team or as consultants, you know, trying to be prescriptive without really doing the legwork and understanding the context that we're working with. I think all those things are, are red flags and, and, and certainly things we need to be cautious about. Well, Jeremy, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. I just note the time it has flown by. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, before we close today, though, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Uh, anyone can reach me through my uh, website, barryonassociates.com. Uh, I do have a book out, and I'm working on another book right now uh, on root cause analysis uh, through LeanPub. It's all about evolution. And actually, that's what my book is going to be about, the evolution of Agile and how to evolve those teams and progress through. I think it's, you're right, like we're in the fourth stage. Um, it's the way command and control, like the manager sitting at the desk kind of barking orders, that's come and gone. Uh, I think even in the 80s and 70s, there were, there were research studies that were saying, like, okay, I think this is kind of time to go. I think now we're at that evolution stage now where I think organizations, especially in this past two years, have realized, okay, we got to make a change. We got to, if we're not, if we want to survive, we got to make that change. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It has just been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Jeremy and his, his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? 
Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.